on the Harmony of Feminist Ethics and Business Ethics, Janet Forgerson. What is feminist ethics? Janet Borgerson's article on the relationship between business ethics and feminist, feminist ethics is extremely detailed and focuses on a number of issues. Um, what we hope to do here is give um, or to focus on those aspects of our article that are most relevant to our practice of business ethics and looking at issues in business ethics. Now, when we look at feminist ethics, we say, what is feminist ethics? Um, that encompasses a broad range of sort of philosophical perspectives. So there isn't one feminist ethic. It's not as if we can say that feminism is like utilitarianism, where there's one fundamental principle that undergirds utilitarian sort of thought, or in a Kantian sense, that there are three formulations of the categorical imperative. And that's what we know that a Kantian approach is going to latch on to one of those. But there are some general um, sort of similarities between all feminist approaches. And so we're going to talk a little about that. And we're also going to talk about the distinctions that Borgerson herself wants to make to clear up what many would take to be misconceptions about what feminist ethics is and how feminist ethics can inform our business ethics thinking. So as a general sort of view, here's a sort of general overview of what most or if not all feminist ethical approaches or ethical theories are doing. So feminist ethical theories are those ethical theories which share two central aims, to achieve a theoretical understanding of women's oppression with the purpose of providing a route to ending women's oppression, and B, to develop an account of morality which is based on women's moral experiences. The first aim is normative, call this the feminist conclusion requirement, and the second descriptive, call this the women's experience requirement. So when we look at theories, if we want to decide whether or not they are actually feminist ethical theories, they really should in some way meet these two sorts of criteria. They want to understand the situation of women or the plight of women in our society, and we want to develop an account of morality based on that experience. So that takes into account that perspective, um, those issues, and somehow address those through our, our moral thinking. So there's some basic distinctions that we have to make. So for those who may have some familiarity with feminist ethics, we'll note that this is a broad sort of category. And oftentimes approaches that have either started as feminist approaches or might have been influenced by feminist approaches aren't necessarily um, feminist. So let's make or want to look at what Borgerson, the distinction she makes in her article. So the first of these distinctions are these four main areas she's addressing. We have the idea of feminist ethics, which she wants to apply in the business um, context. So how can feminist ethics help inform us in our business ethics thinking? There's also, though, another, another area of ethics that's related, and this is feminine ethics. And feminine ethics is different than feminist ethics, as we'll get to in a minute. There's also care ethics, which care ethics is may or may not, I should say, be a feminist approach to ethics. And finally, there's postmodern ethics. Now, for our purposes here, since the previous theories that you've had so far don't really deal with postmodern, we're not actually going to address postmodern ethics, or we're not going to sort of uh, focus on the, uh, the postmodern aspects of her article. But we do want to make the distinctions between these first three, the feminist ethics, feminist ethics, feminine ethics, and care ethics. So first, feminist ethics. So what is a feminist ethical theory? We've got already sort of a very um, general view, but... Borgerson herself says, theories that aim to achieve a theoretical understanding of women's oppression with the purpose of providing a route to ending women's oppression and to develop an account of morality based on women's moral experience in the sense that previously women's experience has been excluded. So when we look at our previous moral theories, many of them are not really feminist approaches. Right? So for example, utilitarianism. If we go back to utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number. So is that a feminist approach? Well, clearly in, in utilitarianism, everyone's pain and everyone's pleasure matter. So in that sense, um, utilitarianism could take into account women's experiences, whether they're experiencing pleasure or pain. Um, but notice that for a utilitarian, if it were the case that women experiencing oppression led to a greater overall utility in some way, then the utilitarians would perfect, be perfectly happy with saying, well, that might just be 
what our utilitarian ethic ends up with. And now clearly a feminist approach is not going to allow that, not going to say that it's okay for some to be oppressed if that oppression actually leads to a greater overall utility. Um, a Kantian approach could in fact be ethical, or I should say feminist ethical in its application, but notice it also is based very much on abstract principles and non um, inter or interpersonal relationships, which we'll get to as we talk more about the sort of nature of feminist ethics. So Kantian approaches, while you might have Kantian, the idea of intrinsic value of individuals and people having um, rights and they ought to all be respected, it's not necessarily the case that a Kantian approach would lead to or would examine the situation of women within society. So feminist, feminist ethics, for something truly to be a feminist ethics, it really needs to take into account the oppression that women have faced, the discrimination that women have faced in society, and the fact that their experiences have been downplayed by others, not only people in general, but also even in philosophical theorizing. Now, feminist, feminine ethics is different. Feminine ethics is a theoretical approach that claims moral insight based upon the traits that have traditionally been ascribed to women. So when we think of a feminine ethic, we think of selflessness, self-sacrifice, caring, supportive, nurturing. These are traits that have been ascribed to women or have been viewed as feminine sort of traits. Now, historically, these things have not been um, thought of as valuable. So we think of so the, the strong, brave, sort of independent sort of virtues. And we look at traditional approaches to ethics as abstract and rational and cold and calculating. And these are the sorts of approaches that have sort of been favored. And these other characteristics have been sort of downplayed. And so what at one point, what many um, both feminist and feminine ethicists want to say is that, look, these things have value. These experiences of women are valuable. Their experiences of caring and support and nurturing these, um, we might also, we might look at these almost as virtues, shouldn't be things that are pushed off to the side or say, well, those, those are great for the home, for example, or the private sphere, but these really aren't public sort of virtues that we should um, be espousing. And so feminist, feminine ethicists have said, no, these are things worth um, pushing as an alternative approach. Now, this is a double-edged sword because one, we look at this and these traits of selflessness and self-sacrifice are somehow intrinsic to women. And many are uncomfortable with that idea that there's some sort of essentialism, that women are essentially this, that they're all self-sacrificing or selfless, um, caring and supportive and nurturing, that these are somehow exclusive to women. And it seems that that's probably not the case. And so by saying that they're exclusive to women, it seems, well, this is only a morality that applies to women or that it essentializes us, that, well, women are naturally this way. And I don't think we want to say, I think there's good evidence to support that both men and women have these sorts of characteristics. So making a feminine approach can oftentimes then relegate certain approach or ethics to a certain group of individuals. We don't necessarily want to do that. Is caring a good thing? Yes, caring is a good thing, whether it's male or female. Is it truly a feminine characteristic or is it just more commonly feminine? And also, do these characteristics of selflessness and self-sacrifice and so forth, are these socially constructed? In other words, are people raised, are girls raised, young girls raised to believe this is how they have to be? And why, on the other hand, shouldn't young boys be raised thinking that these are characteristics that they should also develop? So feminine, feminine ethics can be um, difficult in the sense that it sometimes is attributed to sort of intrinsic um, aspect of individuals. So feminine ethics, you can also see, is much different necessarily than feminist ethics. Feminist ethics is looking at the plight of women and their experiences, while feminine ethics is different. It looks at the traits that we have normally ascribed to women and then use those as a means of judging the rightness or wrongness of certain actions and approaches. Finally, there's care ethics. And care ethics is in many ways related um, to both feminist ethics and feminine ethics. Care ethics may or may not be a feminist approach, but care ethics holds that there is a moral significance in the fundamental elements of relationships and dependencies in human life. Normatively, care ethics seeks to maintain relationships by contextualizing and promoting the well-being of caregivers and care receivers in a network of social relations. So in care ethics, 
care is often presented as a virtue, something that we should develop. Now, notice in care ethics, we're talking about the well-being of caregivers and care receivers. So it's a relational sort of approach rather than looking at what are my abstract duties in a particular case. Do I have a right to something or do I have an obligation to someone? Care ethics is trying to is, is asking us, how do relationships with others actually influence how we ought to treat people, what we should expect and what others can expect of us? And so care in this case is a virtue. Now notice the feminine approach also had care as one of those characteristics. So some care ethics actually originally sort of stem from a feminine notion that these feminine traits have been downplayed and that they shouldn't be downplayed. But note also that care ethics doesn't have to necessarily care about the plight of women. Right? So if a care ethics that doesn't take into consideration the situation of women, um, the context in which care takes place, the way in which caring relations can be exploitive, the way in which social structures can affect who is supposedly the caring individuals in a society, um, if it doesn't take those into account, care ethics themselves, could it, it's possible for someone to be a care ethicist without being a feminist ethicist as well. So we want to be care that we are we want to be careful that we don't confuse care ethics with feminist ethics. They are two separate sort of disciplines. Some care ethics are feminist. Some care ethics are not feminist. It all depends on whether or not, going back to those original definitions that we presented, whether they um, achieve a theoretical understanding of women's oppression and attempt to um, providing some route to ending that oppression in their moral theory. So care ethics, again, is it's based on the idea of relationships and caring relationships, but it's one in which may or may not be feminist in its approach. So why feminist ethics? Now, I'm not asking why feminist ethics in general, but why feminist ethics in the context of business? So what's the importance or what can feminist ethics bring to the issues that we would face in business? So you might say, well, the plight of women in business, but that seems pretty narrow. And it turns out that feminist ethics and the approaches, the sort of ideas, the perspectives, the things that they want you to look at actually are extremely applicable in business situations, in business contexts. So feminist ethics fundamentally calls attention to relationships, responsibility, and experience and their cultural, historical, and psychological context. So what feminist ethicists often do is they want us to look at things in a slightly different perspective. And this is actually what philosophers are always asking us to do. Take a look at things from a different perspective. Think outside the box. And what feminist ethics often does is have us look at something that we take to be sort of common or everyday, that we think there's no problem with that, and then recognize that there are a whole bunch of hidden assumptions and hidden context that we're not seeing. And this can be valuable when we're looking at various issues in business. So let's start with a sort of example to maybe show how some of this works out or how this can be, these feminist ethics principles can apply to real world sort of situations. So let's take the nine to five workday. Now take the example of our standard nine to five workday. Now, in reality, most workdays started around 8.30. So the nine to five is our, you know, we use that phrase all the time, the nine to five, but most people start between eight and 8.30 in, in business and end after five o'clock. But let's just use this as a general sort of idea. So when I talk about the nine to five workday, I'm really talking about the eight to six workday or 8.30 to 5.30 workday that we often have, most that we see most people have who are on the, the sort of normal day without the second shift or third shift. What are the assumptions of the nine to five work day? Well, we have our official 40 hour work week, five days a week, you know, 40, hours a, 40 hours a week, five days in that week in the office generally means you're more reliable or productive. So if you work as many people do, in an office sort of situation, being seen in the office, being around the office is often looked at favorably. And statistically, as I mentioned, most employees start between 8 and 8.30 in the morning. So as much as we say we have the 40-hour work week, five days a week, the reality is, one, many people often work past that 40 hours and past those five days, people bringing home work on the weekends. And most days actually start earlier than that. Most people are expected to be in the office earlier than the, the normal nine to five. 
But there's our sum. We have we have this is our assumption that the good worker is at their desk, at their desk early, working a full week, and they're being reliable and productive. So what's the problem with this? Right? This has been going on for a very long time. We've had a, this sort of typical work week for um, many years now. Well, one of the problems we have with this, or we could identify, is that let's look at this a little differently. That the 9 to 5, 40-hour work week has a blindness to familial obligations. And familial just means family obligations. All right, so we have our 1950s version of our vision of the family with the female. If you're a female worker, female equals childless or daycare. So the assumption is that if you're female, you either don't have any kids, and if you do have kids, you're going to find daycare for them somewhere. That's going to come out of your pocket, by the way, for daycare. Male, the assumption is you're childless, or child care is done by someone else, by your partner or wife. Now, perhaps this is shifting a little bit, but in most cases, it's still assumed that the male is not doing child care. And this ignores other sorts of family structures. So we have this sort of um, view of fami families where we have a male, we have females, we have child. If there is a child, the female is um, going to be spending most of the time or doing most of the child rearing, where the men, not so much. But what's the reality of modern families? Well, again, to look at this from a perspective of, from a more feminist perspective, one, family structures are often not two-parent. Um, there's a good reason that there's a lot of single-parent homes. There's a lot of co-parenting going on. And oftentimes, even in a context in which you have a male and female as the in a household with a child, and even when they say, you purport to say that we split work 50-50, it turns out that statistically, a disproportionate amount of work is often placed on the female in the relationship. That oftentimes, whether that by the way, whether that female is working full time or not. And so we oftentimes structurally fall back into sort of what one might consider old fashioned patterns, that if it's a two parent family that, well, they're splitting at 50 50. This is the modern, this is the 21st century. But it turns out that actually, statistically, the work disproportionately falls on women in a family. So this is one of the assumptions that we make. We have a blindness to this. So the reality of my modern families is one that dual income households, about 54% of households are dual income. Um, in 1960, only 13% of households were single parent, whereas in 2017, over 35% are single parent homes. So that's over a third of workers are going to be in a single parent home. Um, and even when there is those, when it isn't a single parent home, there is a question of how much of the work is going to disproportionately fall on women as opposed to men. Oh, and one other thing, what's the typical school day? So let's think about the way in which we've structured businesses. We've structured businesses with this, as I said, eight to five, eight to six sort of work day, although we call it nine to five. And yet, the majority of children have to be at school by 8.30, and they're usually out by 3 o'clock. Well, notice this conflicts with our normal workday. So if we assume a 9 o'clock start, which is actually extremely rare, um, then you have a half hour to get to work. So assuming your commute, you can just make it if you drop your kid off early. If, on the other hand, you have to be at work between 8 and 8.30, dropping your child off in the morning now becomes an issue. Because assuming you have an average commute in the United States, which is about 20 to 25 minutes, then that means you have to make sure that your child is at school by 8 o'clock or earlier, assuming that your school actually allows the child to come in that early. So now we've got issues with dropping kids off in the morning, but more, probably more problematic is in the afternoon. If the workday goes till 5 even, a 3 o'clock at the, at the later, and many schools go to 3.30, some by 2.30, um, in my neighborhood, that's what the local grade schools are out by 2.30, then you've already got a problem because where is that child going to go? Well, now here's where daycare, there's transportation issues, um, there's cost of daycare, there's cost of transportation, and there's quality of care. And so businesses, again, they have workers, workers have these familial obligations, but we've set up a structure, uh, an educational structure and a business structure in which it becomes difficult for one to get 
from their business context to school. So again, even assuming your boss allows you to go pick up your child to take somewhere, that also means you've now got a 20 minute commute there, a 20 minute commute back, plus wherever you have to drop your kid off. Notice how this becomes complex. Now we sort of ignore this in situations where, again, if you assume that someone's got a partner at home who can take care of this, or they have the money to for daycare, or they happen to live in a, a public school system that provides aftercare and so forth, and these are some of these problems are alleviated that way. But notice the assumption for workers, oftentimes from a business context, is, well, the workers will take care of that. Well, how are the workers going to take care of that? And who is disproportionately affected by these sorts of arrangements, the way the school day, when a school day starts, when it finishes, and so forth. So I want to focus on what Borgerson points out are some of the three insights of feminist ethics. Because with feminist ethics, when we're looking at even that example um, of the nine to five workday, um, we'll see that her insights of feminist ethics help us look at those situations that we might not, in a way that we might not have looked at in the past. So one is that relationships are important. So when we're making decisions, whether it's business decisions or personal decisions, we should be looking at what types of relationships are are in the mix. So with regard to our employees, are do our employees have obligations to children? Do they have obligations to elderly parents? Do they have obligations to siblings or others? And these relationships are important and somehow should factor into the way in which we treat employees. It's also the case that our relationships with other businesses, with customers, are also important. So relationships are sort of fundamental to human beings in general. So notice our relationships to friends, to family, to neighbors. In every other aspect of our lives, relationships seem to have an importance. And yet in business... We sort of ignore that, yet businesses often talk about their relationship with their customers, their relationship with their clients. And so it might be the case that we should look at both in how we treat employees and how we treat customers and how we treat clients and so forth, how these, how these relationships play out and what are the underlying assumptions of these relationships. The second insight of feminist ethics deals with the taking of responsibility. One of the things that feminist ethics asks us to examine are relationships and responsibilities that are often presupposed by various relationships. So as we already mentioned, relationships are a fundamental aspect of a feminist analysis. The relationships that we have and the relationships that we find ourselves a part of. But along with that is this idea of responsibility, that once I'm in a relationship with others, there are various responsibilities I may or may not have. And the question is, how do I actually... Um, how are those responsibilities ascribed to me? And what Bergerson wants to sort of emphasize is that there's two aspects to responsibility. There can be the taking of responsibility as opposed to simply having responsibility. And oftentimes in the situation of women and minorities and others, there's sort of an assumption of having certain responsibilities. And when one has a responsibility, there's no agency involved. In other words, I didn't choose to have that responsibility or to take on that responsibility. And so what feminist ethicists ask us to do is ask questions about whether or not responsibility ascription is something that the individual has been given a chance to take on, denoting agency, a choice, or whether it's been something that's been sort of thrust upon them. Now, Borgerson notes that there are several different types of responsibility, and all of them are sort of can, we can apply the same analysis. So there's administrative or managerial responsibility. So deciding what should be realized and how it should be realized. So in the context of whether it's business or personal relationships, their responsibility in this sense of administrative. There's accountability who others will turn to once a decision has been made. Again, is this accountability relationship or this accountability responsibility one that is someone has taken accountability or is someone is just assumed to have this accountability for something caretaking commitments of support or backing to someone um, perhaps in terms of resources so in this case responsibility can also be viewed in this lens of taking versus having and finally credit taking credit or blame for actions that did or did not happen these are all senses of responsibility and all of them can have more or less agency in them so one of the things that um feminist ethicists want us to do is recognize when someone has been assumed to have responsibility 
Um, also asking whether someone has been given the option to take responsibility. So is it the case that within a company, people have been given the option or the, cho or the ability to take responsibility or accountability or have been taking credit for their actions? And then the question becomes, if they haven't been given those choices or if certain responsibilities have simply been assumed to be on someone's part, what sort of structural conditions have led particularly women um, to not take responsibility? In other words, if from the text, as you'll remember, the notion of agency, of choice plus responsibility gives you an agency, right? So when you combine the agency and I'm choosing to take responsibility, that's different than having responsibility thrust upon me. And if for some reason I don't take credit or I'm not taking accountability, or I'm not entering into administrative or managerial sort of decision-making or responsibilities. Why is that the case? Why is it structurally, perhaps, that some individuals are not taking responsibility in this way? She also notes that when we assume people have responsibility and they don't take responsibility, that there's an assumption that they can't take. That, in other words, that they need the guidance of others. So they lose even more of their agency in these sorts of situations. So the idea of responsibility, in particular of taking responsibility, is also a fundamental insight of feminist ethics. We want to know what are the conditions that lead one to be able to do this or not do this, and why. And when we ask those questions, those can be important when we're looking at sort of the ethical dimensions of various situations. Finally, there's the whole idea of experience. And I think experience is fairly easy to see how this fits in with the sort of feminist project and how this sort of insight is important. That in the past, we have denied the experiences of women and other minority groups. That we just haven't looked at things from their perspective or we've looked at things from sort of an artificial baseline. So a white male baseline or a white middle-class male baseline. And if we only look at things from those perspectives, then we're going to miss out on the experiences of other individuals and the needs of other individuals and how we can better serve other individuals. And so morally speaking, recognizing that there are other experiences, attempting to look at those experiences and attempting to incorporate those experiences and those individuals in decision-making processes is extremely important. And it's especially important in moral situations to see all the dimensions of a particular moral choice or outcome. She says, feminist ethics has taken special interest in the understandings acquired by particular, often marginalized groups and individuals. Ethical investigations that include such perspectives require listening to others' voices and emphasizing a broader acknowledgement of human interaction and attention to the lives people lead. So the idea is to sort of put yourself into the position of other people. And feminist ethics makes a particular makes this a particular emphasis right that you want to include these other perspectives part of that is simply including those individuals in the decision making process but it's also to ask yourself to, self to step outside your own sort of biases and your own sort of perspective and say how would this look from someone else's perspective how would it look from a perspective of someone for example who doesn't have transportation the way i do or who doesn't have a house or live in a neighborhood or have the resources, daycare and healthcare and other sort of resources that I have. When you ask those sorts of questions, it fundamentally changes what the appropriate outcome or what the appropriate right action may or may not be. So feminist ethics can inform ethical decision-making processes. So when we take these three points, and these are only three, and there are, of course, others. Borgerson is, is sort of emphasizing these three aspects of a feminist approach. But notice that when we make any kind of ethical decision, so we identify the dilemma, what's the actual ethical dilemma? Um, what are the facts of the case? We see this when we actually do our case studies. What are the facts that have occurred in this particular situation? Identify a variety of choices. So given this situation, given this conflict between two values, given these facts, what kind of various options for action are there? In other words, what's the right action? Um, there may be more than one or there may seem to be more than one. But then when we identify the stakeholders and say, well, who will this affect and who is affected by um, these various actions, these choices that we're about to make? So we list those out and then identify the impact of each choice on each stakeholder and the stakeholders resulting impact on your firm. So we can actually look and then say, once we've identified our moral dilemma and the facts surrounding it, and we note that here are all our options, here's what we can do given this dilemma, 
And given these stakeholders, we can ask a further question. Well, okay, if we take choice A and apply it to stakeholders A and B and C, what are the outcome? And if we take choice B and apply it to our various stakeholders, what happens? And how is that then going to impact our firm as well? So from a business standpoint, it makes sense to ask the question not only what the stakeholders are for, for, for example, shareholders, if those are the stakeholders we're considering. How will this action resolving this dilemma affect shareholders? But also, how will it affect our customers? How will it affect our public image? How will it affect the workers within our company? How will it affect the upper management? How will it affect the lower management? So all of these become part of the decision making. And notice that all of those things that we've just mentioned, the relationships, what are the relationships we have with our workers? What's the relationships we have with our shareholders, with um, the people that we serve by the product that we create or the service that we provide? All of those things ask the question, are, are part of those questions we might ask. What's, what's it look like from their perspective? Not only what, of our, what our relationship is, but what is their perspective? How is this going to impact them from, from where they're situated? These sorts of questions, along with responsibility, who is responsible and who has taken responsibility and so forth, these all can be part of the decision-making process. And so feminist ethics asks us to extend our sort of view of who should be included in these decision-making processes.